Hello and welcome everyone to the Star Course series at Varsity Tutors, where it's our mission to collect, connect learners with experts in the subjects they want to learn about. And it doesn't really get more expert than the curator of a Smithsonian Hall of Human Origins, Dr. Rick Potts, who you're about to meet here in just a second as we tour the Hall of Human Origins. It also doesn't seem like there are many subjects we humans should want to learn more about than where we came from and how we got to be who we are, and that's why we're thrilled to take you on this tour of the Hall of Human Origins at the Smithsonian. Now, a couple things we will cover tonight is humans are a communicative species. You see the chat box to the right. Rick and I are going to ask you a bunch of questions to make sure you're a central part of today's lesson and today's tour, so please use that early and often. Also, if you have any questions, it's a great opportunity to be able to ask this curator, Dr. Potts, um, all the questions we have about the origins of our species. So don't hesitate until we end. Put those into the chat box. In the last 10 minutes or so, I'll interview Rick with your questions so we can get as many answers as possible. So with that said, let's start our tour of the Smithsonian Hall of Human Origins. We're going to go and meet your teacher for today, Dr. Rick Potts, and let's get started. Well, this is great to join everyone. Thank you, Brian, for that introduction. And thanks to all for joining us in the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. And welcome to the Hall of Human Origins. It's terrific to spend this time together exploring the lives of early humans, our prehistoric fossil relatives. Our goal today is to learn about the origin of the characteristics that led to to us, the evolution of our species. Scientific research into our own origin depends on the discovery of fossils and archeological remains. It relies on the study of genetics as well as the ancient environments faced by our early ancestors. I think you'll find that as we dig into this subject, we'll learn of the challenges, the successes, and the difficulties of becoming human. So let's dig into this together. So here's our uh, ancestral agenda for today. And first, we'll think about our human characteristics. And I'm really curious and excited to learn what you think. Now, when we talk about human characteristics, we like to think about the unique traits and ways of life that apply to all people, not just your personal qualities, but the things in your life that you share with other humans, no matter where they live in the world. We'll call these the hallmarks of humanity. And some of these hallmarks are language, technology, and imagination, just to give you some examples of more complex human characteristics. Let's start with a question, and you'll need to use these hallmarks to tell me what you think. So here we go. If an alien, See, you're already using imagination. If an alien saw these five earth animals, which one do you think it would think is in charge of things on earth? A, polar bear, B, whale shark, C, eagle, D, tiger, or E, human? Brian, I, you probably have some answers as they come in. That's right. Rick's going to be hands-free so he can take us on a tour of the museum. So I'm going to be checking your answers and uh, relaying along to him. Rick, uh, maybe not surprisingly, um, we've got lots of B's and D's, uh, a few A's and C's, not a whole lot of E's. You guys can all use the, the chat function or the polling function. Those who are chatting in, I've seen a couple E's basically accompanied by LOL or ha ha ha. Um, I think the B's and D's have it here. Yeah, well, well just from these pictures, we might look like the least capable of being powerful and the most dominant species. But when you think about it, in fact, the polar bear, whale shark, bald eagle, and tiger have all been on the endangered species list at one time or another. And humans, well, there are nearly 8 billion of us, our own species around today. Yeah, we're not especially big or strong or fast, but there are so many of us all over the planet, which essentially limits nearly every other animal, where it can live and how well it can thrive. So how do we get to this point? 
Brian, I think you have another question for us. That's right here. We'll, uh, we'll ask a few questions here to get us all started. This one, I think we think of ourselves as having exceptional abilities, uh, but we want to know which of these statements are true. Are we the only animal that can communicate with one another by talking? Do we have the biggest brains? That's B. Do we, are we the only ones with a th opposable thumbs? Are we the only animals that walk on two feet? Or are we the only ones that sweat to cool down? And here's how we're going to do a lot of these multiple choice. There can be more than one right answer. There can be no right answer. So feel free to type them in if you think there's more than one or if there's none. And I see a lot of you doing this here. Um, actually see a, a decent mix here of, uh, of some A's, um, some C's and D's. I see um, a lot of nuns coming in as well. So a pretty good smattering of answers here. Um, Rick, what do you think? Well, the answer is actually none of them. And this is what I mean. Other ca animals can communicate verbally. So it's somewhat similar to talking. We have a really big brain only when compared with our body size, but humans do not own the biggest brain. Lots of primates, the biological group to which we belong, have opposable thumbs. Birds walk on two feet and many other primates can also do so. And finally, uh, let's see, horses. Horses and other animals also sweat to cool down. All of these characteristics are critically important to our survival, but we're not the only ones. It's the combination of qualities and how useful they were when they were developed that has gotten humankind to this point. Brian, let's have another question. All right, let's do it. So another of these, which of the statements are true? It can be none, can be all, can be anything in between. Um, this one's about our technology. Which of these are true? Are human, homo sapiens, I shouldn't say we, Rick uh, corrected me on that at one point. Did, are homo sapiens the only species that's ever controlled fire? The only species that uses tools? The only species that changes its environments um, or the only species that builds structures. And I see you guys are fast with the answers here. Um, see a decent amount of nuns. You may be catching on to, uh, to Rick's MO here. Uh, I see some great answers, kind of a mix of all of these, Rick. A couple people are calling out that monkeys use tools, uh, beavers build structures. Um, they're coming in pretty quickly, but that's the gist of it. Decent mix of all the answers and a healthy number of nuns as well. Yeah, well, the answer again is none. So congratulations to all of you who said none. None of these statements is true. Some earlier ancestors who lived before our species were the first to control fire. One of those ancestors, Homo erectus, controlled fire well before our own species came on the scene. Uh, you're right, other primates, monkeys, for example, use tools. Uh, also, lots of species change their environment and build structures. Uh, think of a bird's nest as one example. Someone said beavers also building dams. Again, all of these characteristics are important, but none by itself is unique to humans. So I think we're getting closer to figuring out what makes humans unique among all other living things. One major goal in the Hall of Human Origins is to approach the question, what does it mean to be human? And so I'd like to ask you that question. Share your thoughts. What do you think it means to be human? It's an open-ended uh, question. Feel free to keep your answers really short. And Brian, give us some of the answers as they come in, please. Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of people type in some pretty amazing things. And look here, I see, um, we damage the world around us, um, but we have the choice to care is a really cool one. Um, I see some interesting ones. We, I, I can operate a remote control. Um, I can play with toys. I can create things. Um, I see we appreciate beauty. Um, I see we know where our next meal is coming from. Um, uh, we've got thumbs, although I think, uh, you know, somebody uh, you know, may, may want to go back to that question before. Uh, I like this. We can remember our ancestors and we can think of the future. So many great answers. Thanks for them all coming in. Um, Rick, I know you've heard a bunch in your years of doing this as well. Uh, what's your reaction? Yeah, those are spectacular answers. That's, that's great. So many great responses here. And, and, you know, actually no one answer is right or wrong. Um, and so maybe my best response is to let me share with you one of my favorite answers. Um, the study of our origin really highlights our flexibility, the human ability to adjust 
and change to the circumstances around us. This flexibility is going to be a common theme of our exploration today and figuring out how our adaptive flexibility evolved helps us understand how we ended up as a worldwide species. Also, you know, recall an earlier screen, we have sophisticated language, which I assume you're using as you key in your answers. We also have advanced technology like laptops and cell phones. We have imagination and creativity, which allow us to think about things not immediately in front of us. And as we're doing right now, we can combine and pool our knowledge together. Each of these characteristics has an origin long ago. Our physical traits, such as the size of our teeth or our ability to, to walk upright, as well as our mental and social traits, such as our ability to learn or the fact that we grow up slowly and need a lot of care. These traits all helped our ancestors survive. Earlier species in our evolutionary tree had some of these same traits, but only humans today have the entire package. Our unique characteristics did not develop all at once. Instead, the addition of one after another over time led to a combination that defines our species and how it is unique among all others. Before we go on, let me just give you some, a little bit more background here. Uh, first, as you can see you know, on the screen on the, on the left, evolution is not some straight line of progress. We're not descended from any ape, but we do have common ancestors. In fact, we are related to all other primates, remember our biological group. Genetics and the fossil record confirm this kinship with other primates, but it's not a straight line connection. Instead, the human evolutionary tree, what we might call our family tree, has many species besides ourselves and many branches. As you can see in the center of the screen, our family tree is branching and diverse, pretty much like the evolutionary trees of virtually all other organisms. The oldest species near the bottom of the tree looked a lot like other primates. Toward the present, near the top of the tree, we find that more and more human-like traits have evolved. Also, we are not, um, uh, while we're not alone in our family tree, there are many other species, we are the only one that remains. All of these other relatives of ours shown in the circles are only known from fossils. So in short, there wasn't any parade. There was no victory march with one species progressing into another in a line. Instead, there were hardships that challenged the lives of these earlier species. And then you can see in that final image on the right, that the effort to understand human evolution goes on and on through the discovery of fossil skulls that you could see in the picture, all sorts of fossil bones of early ancestors, also uh, stone tools and other artifacts made by those predecessors of ours, even sculptures and painted stones created by early people of our own species, Homo sapiens. And so from here, let's add another type of evidence footprints. And so let's begin our tour of the Smithsonian Hall of Human Origins. What we're seeing here is an exact replica of a set of footprints preserved in hardened ash. The ash erupted from a volcano in East Africa more than three and a half million years ago, very long time ago. And these are the oldest known footprints indicating bipedal walking, that is walking on two legs with a human-like foot. Well, who might have made these footprints? Well, let's look over here. Around the same time as the footprints that we were just looking at, we see the fossilized bones in East Africa of an early human relative 
known as Australopithecus afarensis, fossils that were found in the Afar region of Ethiopia. There are hundreds of fossils of this species known, and yet the most famous is a remarkable skeleton that you see here named Lucy. That's the nickname that the scientists gave to her. Her species had all the indications of being bipedal like we are, while also possessing long and powerful arms and curved finger bones and curved toe bones indicating that her species could uh, walk upright and she was adept at climbing trees. She could do both. She was comfortable on the ground walking on two legs and she could also, and her species live comfortably in the trees. So let's think about another question. Why might walking on two feet versus four be a major advantage? All right, Rick, they've got some answers coming in. Thanks to all of you for, uh, for coming. These, these come in pretty quickly. Um, to summarize, a lot of them are on the hands, right? A lot of people are saying we can hold things, we can carry things, as we can pick fruit off of trees, um, we can develop our hands to have dexterity to do all kinds of different things. A couple of people are mentioning things about our heads being higher up because we're not hunched over on all fours. So maybe we could see predators or opportunities. Uh, most of them have to do with our use of our hands and a few of them with, with where our heads are. Well, that's right on the mark. Uh, that's, those are great answers. And so many of the things important to human life today, uh, using tools, some of the things that were mentioned, um, using tools, walking long distances, uh, building things, writing, uh, typing, as some of you are doing right now. These aspects of human life result from the fact that our hands are available to do the things our brains think of. So part of what is uniquely human and how humans evolved depends on having our hands free, basically at all times. Another point though, we've got to take care in how we think about walking upright. Yeah, certainly there were advantages, but walking upright has some disadvantages too. Can you think of any? Well, for instance, all of our body weight is supported on fewer bones and fewer joints. So we're susceptible to strains and stresses that cause pains in our back, the hip, and our knees. Walking bipedally means we're also a little bit slower. So without finding innovative ways to use their hands, our ancestors were more likely to become prey. So traits that we consider to be evolutionary advantages often had to overcome disadvantages. This is one of the hallmarks of the process of evolution. The beneficial traits aren't necessarily advantageous forever unless they're combined with other favorable traits and circumstances. Being bipedal wasn't enough. Like Lucy's species, lots of our bipedal relatives went extinct. Today, we are the last biped standing. So why us? Let's continue to investigate. And while Rick's on the move, he wanted to ask another question to kind of set up what we're getting into next. Uh, he wants to know, what were your favorite toys when you were little? It's also a pretty cool artifact here. He'll describe a little bit more. Rick, they've got answers coming in quickly to this one. Uh, people have some opinions. I see blocks, dolls, balls, crayons, musical instruments, video games. I see an iPad, slides, swings. Tricycles, bicycles, anything that moves, um, all kinds of pretty incredible markers, pencil, all kinds of great answers. Um, so uh, hopefully plenty for you to be able to work with. Yeah, these, these answers remind me of when I was a kid and played with these same sort of toys. And what I really like about these answers is that they actually demonstrate uh, our theme today. Remember what that theme is, the hallmarks of flexibility. And many of your answers combine traits that emerged long ago and, and at different times. Yet when combined in you and me and all other people today, they're an intriguing part of our flexibility. Your favorite toys, the ones you just mentioned, required your hands to be free to manipulate and handle things. They required your mind, your brains, to think up clever things to do and ways to play. Toys require imagination to turn a basic object into an activity. I don't know, I can't remember whether any of you mentioned crayons as something that you liked when you were little, but 
what you see on the screen are the world's oldest known crayons. They're dug up from an excavation site dated around 250,000 years ago. There are pieces of pigment, coloring material, bits of soft rock that were rubbed and used to create color. And color becomes a way of communicating, communicating with others in art and other symbols of our identity. So I like your answers because the combination of hands and tools, brain and imagination ended up becoming a very important part of what it means to be human. So now we're getting even deeper into this topic of human flexibility, not just of the body, but of our minds and creativity too. You already know having our hands free was vital to tools and technology. Over hundreds of thousands of years of changing environments and ecosystems and climates, tools may have single-handedly made human life possible. They opened up our diet to beef that could be cut or had to be cut in order to eat, or nuts that had to be cracked before you could eat them, the, the delicious part of the nut. When one food source went scarce, our ancestors could use another source of food because they had tools. Eventually, the ability to, to make and control fire was a kind of tool, which became very important to human life. As you may recall, first in an early human ancestor, and then later on in our own hands. When you combine tools with a brain that can imagine how to be creative or how to modify tools to become more effective, now those hands have enormous power. The human ability to adjust to different settings and circumstances has been critical as our species experienced environmental changes in the past and began to expand from our African origin to all over the world living in essentially every habitat. Now recall, all earlier human species, our bipedal relatives, are no longer around. Their ways of life are, are gone, they're extinct. Surprisingly, the great similarity people show in their genes, the genetic similarity of all people alive today, no matter where they live in the world, this remarkable similarity began as a uh, a very small population. It's even plausible that humanity itself was an endangered species only about 100,000 years ago. Our species and our closest relatives, Neanderthals and Homo erectus, for example, evolved during very difficult times, strong changes in climate, large volcanic eruptions, lots of challenges to survival. And yet the mental, social, and creative flexibility of our species prevailed. And so ours is the species that ultimately spread around the world. So now let's walk to another place in the Hall of Human Origins. And while Rick is on the move to uh, to get to the Cave of, Ma of Imagination, which is a pretty great spot there, we'll make sure you get plenty of uh, visual here to uh, to see the hall here. But he did have one more question for you. He wants to know, what is something we use our brains to do that other animals do not? So keep your answers coming in. We're going to go back full screen here um, to Rick to make sure that you guys get the benefit of uh, being able to see everything that's in the hall. And Rick, as you're getting set up there, they've got some pretty amazing answers here. They've been coming in quickly. Some of my favorites here, uh, math, art, music, imagination, um, reading. Um, I see making plans, worrying. Um, I saw taxes come by. Uh, a couple of people saying homework. Uh, a lot of things related to creativity and imagination. Uh, somebody saying studying our origins, which takes us back to where we are. So that's a pretty decent summary of what folks had to say. Wow, those are great answers and uh, welcome to the cave of imagination. And so when I think about those great answers, my reaction is, uh, well, we're certainly not unique in having a brain, but our brains have the unique ability to think beyond what we can see, hear, and feel. We can imagine, which means we can create new things. We can create tools, 
simple machines and eventually complex machines like bicycles and cars and spaceships. We can trace the ability to innovate back to more than 300,000 years ago, right around the time of the origin of our species. Rather than making the same kind of tools over and over again for many, many generations, our early ancestors of our species began developing new technologies and planning, planning how to make new tools. Our species began to use highly val valued rocks that came from far away, most likely traded with distant groups. It must have taken language, some shared way of communicating and exchanging information to enable these developments. Eventually, the ability to create symbols and symbolic language where utterances were organized into complex meanings allowed our brains to be connected. We often think, you know, of our brains or as our minds as something inside our own skull. And yet with symbols and, and language, the ideas and innovations in your brain can be shared with others. And so our brains became networked, linked with one another, allowing one thought to merge and to grow with other thoughts. And so innovations in our thinking and behavior could accumulate and amplify into really astonishing levels of learning and flexibility in our ways of life. Language, art, and music are all examples of our imaginative minds. These powers even allow us to think and imagine things beyond what we can see or experience directly. Now, it's important, important to realize that the human brain is a very expensive organ. And by that, I mean that it requires a lot of energy to grow and maintain, a lot of calories, which depends upon nutrition and a rich food supply. But the expensive brain that, our, that evolved in our ancestors ultimately enabled our species to synthesize information from all of our senses and to share information with one another. And that has accelerated our ability to innovate and to evolve. So in short, fueled by our ability to create symbols, to understand the world in symbolic ways, we gained a new way of understanding the world, along with the power to spread messages, to record lessons that we learn, and to share our collective knowledge and wisdom. Our imagination is surely one of the most critical evolutionary advantages. Well, follow me and let's think more about the human brain. And again, while Rick's on the move, he's got another question for you to kind of set up what we're going to talk about next. He wants to know, uh, what is, we talked about our brains being an expensive organ, but also really beneficial to us. What is a disadvantage of having disproportionately large brains? And Rick, while you're getting set up there, um, obviously we know this group already. They've got quick answers here. Um, I see a lot relating to uh, maybe the picture has something to do with headaches, um, stress, worries, all those kinds of things. Um, being able to be envious or jealous um, or, uh, or thinking about what other people have. I see a few things like that. And then a couple around babies. I see uh, babies can't support their own heads because their brains are too big. Childbirth is difficult. So I think we have a lot about stress, worry, thinking about things that may be a, you know, a disadvantage or, uh, or you know, just the fact that our heads are really, really big. Yeah, well, all you students out there are really thinking hard about this. Those are, those are really excellent answers also. Um, and you're picking up on the idea that as we mentioned before, evolutionary advantages can also come with the disadvantages. Having a large brain means also that it takes a long time for that brain to grow. We're born unable to walk or crawl or use our hands for many months. From the time we're born, it takes about five or six years to reach the brain size of an adult. And the connections inside our brains, that is how the nerve cells connect with one another, keep changing and maturing as we learn and grow up over many, many years. So I'd like to ask you a follow-up question, everyone out there. And do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage for humans to be born so helpless and grow up slowly. 
All right, Ricky Novus Group, the answers are coming in. Looks like we're seeing a mix of both. Um, I think it's safe to say disadvantage is uh, is carrying, I don't know if it's a vote, um, but carrying the vote right now. Probably two-thirds to three-quarters of people saying disadvantage. That seems to be holding up and uh, and a few advantages as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. You, well, you might think it's entirely a disadvantage to grow up slowly. I mean, we all want to grow up fast, don't we? Um, but uh, you think of a disadvantage, not only for a child, but also how about the responsibility placed on mom or dad, the family or any other person who takes care of us as we're growing up. But think of something else too, as, we, as you think about it, the, the constant care that babies and toddlers require also means that we form extremely close bonds and relationships with one another. So growing up slowly offers the time for kids to learn, to play, to explore their surroundings. And that's also a really important element of being human. Fossils, like the one you see on the screen, um, show that human ancestors have long taken care of one another. Now here's a fossil skull of a, an individual who lived nearly 2 million years ago. The skull belonged to an old man whose teeth fell out probably five years or more before he died. Someone had to care for him when he got really, really old. And here's a fossil skull of another individual. This is a cast, a re an exact replica of a fossil skull that belonged to a Neanderthal who lived about 65,000 years ago. At an early age, around the age of uh, eight or nine years old, this Neanderthal had the left side of his skull bashed in and it fractured. It fractured the skull and it also affected the, that side of the brain, the, the left side of the brain. Well, that side of the brain affected the opposite side of the body and its development, the development of the right side of the body. And as it turned out from an early age, this individual couldn't walk or use his right arm. This Neanderthal lived yet for a long, long time, for about another 50 years. And so for decades, the social group uh, had to take care of him. Caring for one another is also seen in early evidence of controlling fire. Human ancestors came together at the hearth to share meals. And that's also a way, sharing of meals, of taking care of one another. Our nature is to be social and to find ways to tell each other stories through the language, art, and music. We inherited these skills from earlier species who used them in practical ways, such as to warn of danger or to communicate an opportunity. Hey, look, there's food over here. But also they use these abilities to build community and organize how those ancestors lived and worked together. And so do we. Humankind's deep sense of community is the vital part of our flexibility, an essential ingredient in what it means to be human, helping us not only to survive, but also to thrive. So now let's conclude in another part of the Hall of Human Origins. These skulls and other fossil bones, uh, the footprints that we looked at earlier, and the stone artifacts that we've seen today, all belong to ancestors of ours that had their own stories. By discovering and seeking to understand them, and by you participating in this class today, we're honoring those ancient individuals, learning their stories. It's the only way we could have learned about them. And we begin to understand how earlier species contributed to what it means to be humans today. I appreciate this time together. You've been a terrific class and your answers have been great. And we've been able to use our brains, our free hands, technology, imagination, and the capacity for community and communicating to learn about the roots of our humanity. 
All right. Hey, thank you so much, Rick, for just an amazing tour, an amazing overview, like 300,000 plus years of history in about 35 minutes, really expertly told. So, uh, so thank you. Thanks to all of you out there for all of your participation. It's been so fun reading all of your comments and questions and apologies. Wasn't able to get to all the comments because they were coming in really quickly, but I have been making notes on a lot of your questions. So Rick, we, uh, we've we got some audience questions um, for you here as you stand in front of the wall of skulls, which is, uh, is so cool. Um, one one really common one was about timeline. A lot of people wanted to know, um, particularly with Lucy's skeleton, how old that was, but maybe even a little bit more. Um, I know you mentioned at one point, you know, our, our species is about 300,000 years old. How these developments of, of developing imagination and tools and language, can you give us an, an, an a, you know, extent of like how, how quickly or, or slowly did a lot of these changes take place? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. The timeline is really important for all of this. And so I, I really appreciate the, the chance to, to talk about that. Uh, to get to the first one about Lucy and how old Lucy is, you know, those footprints we looked at were a little bit over three and a half million years ago. And fossils of Lucy species are known all the way back of, 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 to that time period and even earlier in time. Lucy herself, the skeleton, uh, is uh, 3.2 million years old. So 3,200,000 years ago. These are mind blowing numbers that we, we talk about all the time. They just roll off my tongue really easily, but it's sometimes hard to wrap your mind around it. When you look at then that evidence for walking upright on two legs, coupled with still keeping uh, you know, to the trees on occasion. And then you look at when stone technology comes in. We have some hints of stone technology around that same time as Lucy's species, but it really doesn't get going in a big way until about two and a half million years ago, a little bit earlier than that. And so it really then begins to uh, get going. And it's only later in time that we see the expansion of the brain. Really, the biggest rate of increase in, in the brain size relative to the size of the body is the last one million years. OK, so we've gone from you know, three and a half million years to 3.2 million years, stone tools at two and a half million, increasing brain size, especially after one million years. And our own species it has, is the accumulation of all that kind of uh, those kinds of changes. Um, and uh, the earliest fossils of our species about 300,000 years ago. And that's when we also see those signals of innovation in stone technology. When you look at the whole sweep of human evolutionary history, the very, very earliest evidence of walking upright uh, and having an upright body and keeping it that way for a sustained work period goes all the way back to about 6 million years ago. And so that's a rough idea of the timeline of human, human evolutionary history. And please understand that the rise of farming, civilization, cities, uh, and industrial life, that's all much, 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 much later uh, than the uh, developments we're talking about here. Thank you. Wow. A, a whole lot of history. Uh, I was, I'm even more impressed now that we covered that much history in, uh, in such a short time that it goes back millions of years. And, and thanks to everyone for the questions. Another big theme. So time was a big theme. Um, another theme in a lot of the questions was about food. You know, you sort of mentioned that tools was, was a hallmark of flexibility because it allowed us to diversify the things that we ate. Do you know much about what did the earliest human ancestors eat? How did the menu expand? Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the specifics of the food that our ancestors were eating at different times? Yeah, yeah, it's really uh, interesting. And I've, I've dug up some sites in, uh, in my work in uh, East Africa um, where, um, you know, they're an elephant butchery site that's dated about one million years old. And you can see um, a, we had a, a fossil um, uh, elephant, an extinct form of elephant, um, preserved almost completely, surrounded by um, almost 2,300 sharp stone flakes, or ones that had been originally sharp but were then dulled. And you can actually see the butchery marks on the ribs and, and other parts uh, of, the, uh, of the elephant. And so that was really cool to, to find that. We dug that up a number of years ago. But when you go back even to the earliest stone technology, say the technology of about two and a half million years ago, um, we see that it's pretty simple. You basically had a stone, a rounded rock. You had an oblong rock that could be struck with the, with the uh, rounded one. And what would fly off were sharp flakes, slivers of rock. 
And so with those three ingredients, what we call a core, the rock that was struck, the hammerstone and the sharp flakes, well, all I can say is that you see early humans then beginning to really expand their diet. Um, a hammerstone can crush more effectively than an elephant's molar. And a sharp stone flake can cut better than a lion's canine tooth. And so you can imagine then with even that simple technology, all of the foods of the African savanna, the grassland and woodland and forests were opened up to those early humans who made those early tools. And the development of technology was then very slow. It was those, those tools were great. They served those early humans for a long period of time. And it wasn't until eventually around the origin of our species that you begin to get innovations, a real diversified toolkit, tools that could do different things and have different shapes for different purposes. And that's kind of like the toolkits that we carry around now. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for uh, for asking. I'm going to try to forget the term elephant butchery later on tonight, but everything else, I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, one, one question that's come up a lot, and you sort of mentioned early on, you're discovering um, some of these things. A lot of people want to know about, you know, a combination of your work. Can you tell us what do you do as, uh, as someone, you know, with, with, you know, the kind of job you have going out in the field and researching? And then a little bit of, you talked a little bit about finding tools and fossils, but how do we become so certain what those tools might have been used for, how old they were. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of a day in the life of, uh, of someone like you in the field? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. Well, my job at the Smithsonian is what's called a curator. Uh, and so I take care of, uh, of collections, but I also take care of collections in the, the countries where I have collaborations. So I work a lot with the National Museums of Kenya, a country in East Africa, the capital Nairobi, and about three hours outside of Nairobi, there is a site that I've worked at for, well, a long time, decades. And at first I thought I was only gonna work there for maybe three years. Well, we're now in our third decade of working there because of the ability to date the site to, in a very precise way using uh, the uh, radioactive materials. It's not harmful, but the radioactive change from one chemical to another in a, a, a clock-like way to date uh, the sediment layers that have built up over time and are now exposed by erosion. So my work then in the field is to go out and uh, we have a big survey team of, uh, of local people. People have become great friends of mine over the years. And we look for where uh, rain and wind has eroded materials, that is fossils and um, uh, as well as stone artifacts out of layers where they had once been buried. Once we find those, we track them up to those layers where those fossils and stone tools came from and we start digging and we can then find the exact places where those elephants died or those particular early human teeth fell out onto the ground or where stone tools were left behind. What I kind of call, think of as the, uh, the business cards, the calling cards of those early ancestors of ours going back sometimes millions of years. And so we have another site that we work in, in Kenya uh, that is uh, in Western Kenya. There's a very, very large lake, of course, Lake Victoria. And right on the edge of that, we also have another series of sites. And there we have found evidence of actually these early technologies. And we have a, a, a colleague uh, who is based in Italy, and she has been able to figure out ways of looking for little polishes and microscopic wear on the edges of those tools and to relate them to whether the tool was used for cutting meat, cutting into a bone, um, whittling wood, um, so woodworking and cutting meat, cutting bone, um, and, and digging in the ground to dig up uh, roots and tubers, which are actually very nutritious. You may think that you wouldn't want to try them, but they're really nutritious. And early humans back to 2 million years ago were doing all those things with these stone tools. So being clever and coming up with new methods to look at uh, where on the edges of tools is how we, one of the ways at least, in which we find out how they were eating and how the tools were used. 
that's really fascinating. You could tell that uh, that you really love what you do when you talk about it. So uh, I think a lot of people have, have figured out a new answer to what they want to be when they grow up today. Uh, but maybe a little more immediately, um, quite a few people wanted to know what you can tell us about the Smithsonian. Where is it? How do we come visit it? Why should we come visit it? So uh, maybe a little bit, you know, kind of near term for people. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, where you're standing right now? Well, why you should come visit it is that there's a lot of cool stuff in the Smithsonian and it's free uh, to get into the buildings of many, many different museums of the, of the Smithsonian. The one we're in right now is the Natural History Museum and it's based in Washington, DC. Uh, so the Smithsonian Institution, most of the, its museums uh, are in Washington, DC, but there are museums in a couple of other places, New York City, there's one. There's also research stations in different parts of the world. And uh, so the one, uh, the museums here in Washington, D.C. are devoted to, uh, uh, to art, to culture, to history, and to science. And uh, the Nat uh, Natural History Museum, it's the most visited natural history museum in the world. It's often pretty crowded, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a great place to come. As I say, it's free to get in here. And on the first floor of, the, of this museum, uh, you can go through a hall devoted to uh, the ocean, uh, the, uh, the oceans of the world, uh, to uh, mammals, uh, the, one of the biological groups to which we belong. And of course, in between those two halls is the Hall of Human Origins where we are right now. So come on over uh, and, uh, and see, come to Washington, D.C., see if you can get your, your parents to do it or, or wait a little bit and come yourself. And uh, it's a great place to, to, to be. And uh, you can see a lot of a lot of things here, and um, I hope they will inspire many of you to become uh, researchers, scientists, uh, people who are interested in the cultures of other peoples around the world, uh, all sorts of uh, possibilities and aspirations that grow out of being at the Smithsonian. I second that emotion. Um, I wandered in because it was free. It was a rainy day one time. I was in D.C. I'm like, oh, let's pop in and check it out. Thought I'd stay for an hour. Probably spent uh, four or five hours right where you're standing um, soaking it all in. So if you have a chance to visit, um, I highly recommend it as uh, someone whose first inclination was, hey, it's free. I might as well check it out. So um, really, really cool there. Uh, hey, maybe one last question for you. We'll kind of end big picture. Um People have, have, have been absorbing the, the timeline of how long all this took place. That you know, they know you've got all this expertise in seeing different artifacts and things. Um, so a lot of people wanted to know things, sort of like if you could go back to any one point in uh, in all of this history to see what was happening, find a turning point that you would find maybe the most fascinating to know about where humans came from, where we're going, any of those kind of things. Um, what one point in history would you go back to to investigate? What would you want to see? Who would you want to talk to and, uh, and why? Oh, wow, that's a great question. And as you can uh, tell from uh, our time together today that uh, there were many turning points and many benchmarks in the, uh, the prehistory and the evolutionary history of, of human beings. It's kind of hard to say that there was only one. And you know, I've been asked this question uh, before once when I thought to myself that, well, you know, if I went and spent a day uh, with any other early human species way back far in time, like when first walking upright or the first tool makers, something like that, I probably wouldn't really understand much of what they were doing. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to ask, ask them questions. Um, we wouldn't have shared language uh, abilities uh, together. And if I only had, let's say, 24 hours, oh, I'd stay awake that whole 24 hours. I'd be so amazed and fascinated. But I wouldn't really get an understanding of how they changed over time. The multiple benchmarks, remember, the, uh, the essential ingredients of being human did not arise all at once, but over a long period of time. So when I thought about that question, I think that my answer, if I had a time machine, is that I wouldn't go back in time. I would instead go maybe 100, maybe 200 years, even just 50 years into the future to find out all the things that I do not know, <laughs> to find out all the discoveries uh, that have been made uh, by students who I have never met. And maybe I'd be able to see some of the discoveries and ideas and, and inspirations that come from our spending this time together tonight, maybe discoveries made by some of the students 
uh, attending tonight. So uh, I hope you felt inspired by this kind of uh, this kind of work, uh, and I've enjoyed our time together. And um, all I can say is that uh, you know keep working hard at whatever inspires you, and maybe some of this aspect of our own evolutionary history, our own origins, will be one of the things that really inspires you to do great work. Thank you so much, Rick, and everybody out there. I think we know what our job is. Rick wants to learn from us now, so uh, he's sort of not quite fully passing the torch, but uh, but definitely giving us a challenge of, of what to do. Uh, like Rick mentioned, whatever fascinates you, if you work hard at it, you can make amazing discoveries. So on our way out, we want to show you guys some, uh, some more ways to be able to learn, discover passions, and work on those with Varsity Tutors. That includes our learning memberships, where you can get help on the subjects you need help on. You can explore the subjects that, uh, that you really Really want to continue to learn and, and are passionate about, like Rick talked about. Obviously, with the Smithsonian, there are all kinds of free museums and cool free resources available online as well. So, uh, so here's some ways to uh, to visit us, uh, both at Varsity Tutors and the National Museum of Natural History, uh, to connect with us on social media. Maybe you want to let uh, Rick and the team know what uh, what you loved learning about tonight. Let your social network know uh, how much you enjoyed tonight. So uh, here's some next steps for you on your path to making those discoveries that Rick would love to learn from you. Um, Rick, thank you so much. This was uh, such an honor to be able to present together and uh, in such a fascinating class from a fascinating location. Thanks to all of you for all of your questions and participation, and we'll see everybody back here soon. Thank you, Brian.